almost October. Um, and uh, there is still humanity in this uh, great state of ours. Uh, this is our first hearing since we got out of session. And we're trying to do two today and then uh, cover some more topics tomorrow, kind of clustered so that you would um, be able to do whatever else it is that you have to do that's important. Uh, I know you're all busy in other aspects of your life, and I'm really happy that so many have come today. And I assume some more members will come and go. Um, and uh, the point of these, I guess, three or four hearings, however you want to count them, uh, we might actually go straight through tomorrow and not take a lunch break, is what we're thinking at this point. Uh, we do plan to take a lunch break uh, whenever we finish the morning's work and then uh, come back because there's a lot of people interested in the min choices and that's a kind of a time certain one o'clock. Um, there are many things, I just came from a MAXA meeting this morning so I'm all charged up on coordination and collaboration and, and uh, integration and, and all of that and so together we serve over a million people with varying levels of needs and Every level that touches that all means well. We mean well, the department, counties, the clients all have interests and in success. And uh, things come up over the course of uh, those um, in our interactions. And today's meeting is uh, meant to talk about some things that have come up since session or that we want to be working on uh, coming into session. And so uh, generally, we're going to meet these two days come back the first part of November and meet for, I think, two days. And then that will probably be it for the year. So I know there's a big sigh of sadness. You couldn't come in December. But uh, January is coming, not to worry, and session and all that. So um, we have, I think, a schedule we can maintain pretty well uh, to be within the two-hour framework. Um, and But we do want to discuss these topics as thoroughly as we need to. and so we can learn about some of the issues of fraud and how things are getting implemented and, and all that and, and be in a position to better serve. And so um, there's a witness list, clearly. Um, but as time goes on, don't be shy to uh, stop into my office or other members' offices and offer your thoughts. And our, our best work is done when we all kind of chip in together. Um, there's only one thing certain coming out of Washington is that something might be different. Um, and the more we're on top of our game focused on what we're trying to really accomplish and who we're trying to serve in what way, the more we can uh, help to uh, focus our oversight and our resources on those. So that's meant to encourage you in a world of quite great uncertainty today. So um, with that, uh, welcome to the committee. Um, and, uh, and so we're going to be talking about uh, fraud. And uh, we have a PowerPoint, looks like. So. Yes. Yeah, welcome, Ms. Voss. Um, thank you. For the record, my name is Joe Voss, and I'm with the Legislative Auditor's Office, and I'm here to present a short overview of our 2017 evaluation of home and community-based services. Before I begin, though, I would like to introduce Jennifer Hildry, who is sitting right behind me. She was another member um, of the uh, team that put, put together this report. Our evaluation had two parts. First, we looked at cost. We looked at what it costs to provide home and community-based services to adult recipients with disabilities in 2015, fiscal year 2015. And then we looked at what it costs to provide the different types of services um, that fall under the heading of home and community-based services, and how much cost varied um, when it was provided to people with different types of disabilities. We then turned our attention to financial oversight tools that the Department of Human Services has to actually oversee the spending. With that, I'd kind of like to start at the very end of, end of things. Um, we spend a lot of money for home and community-based services, $2.4 billion in fiscal year 2015. It provided services to about 64,000 adults with disabilities. Um, Nearly 75% of this money went to pay for services that are provided in residential settings, that is settings such as recipients' own homes and apartments, their families' homes, um, foster care homes, and assisted living units. We found, though, that the Department of Human Services doesn't closely regulate some of the workers who go into recipients' own homes. 
And so we think the legislature and the department should change how they regulate these providers and ask for increased documentation for, um, for the services that they provide. And I'll get into a little bit more detail as, as we go on. So let me back up now and sort of define what I mean when I say home and community-based services. And I'll probably just refer to it often as HCBS because it's much shorter. Um, the phrase actually refers to a broad array of activities that are intended to help people with limited abilities live in their own communities. I've listed out some examples here um, on this slide. Page 22 of our full report, which I believe is in your folders, actually has a more exhaustive list of all the different types of services that um, can fall under the, the classification of HCBS. Again, the services are meant to keep people as independent as possible and out of institutions. We also define home and community-based services broadly to include the services provided through the state medical assistance plan to people with disabilities, as well as to include the services that are provided through one of the state's five federally approved waivers, which are listed here on this slide. Waivers give the state a lot more flexibility in who they provide home and community-based services to and the specific types and intensity of services provided. Four of the waivers are directed at people with certain types of disabilities, and the fifth one just covers the elderly, the elderly population. The big difference between getting home and community-based services through the state plan as opposed to through one of the waivers is that in order to be a waiver recipient, you have to be at risk of institutionalization if you don't get the services. This slide shows the average cost of home and community-based services in fiscal year 2015, depending on how the services were provided. The top bar refers, um, shows that it costs on average about $13,000 per recipient to receive services under the state plan. Um, these in fiscal year 2015, about 28, 27, 28,000 people received home and community-based services under the state plan. The next five bars show how much it costs to provide those services to people through one of the waivers. The most costly waiver covered people with chronic health conditions, and it cost about $170,000 per year to provide these services. Only about a little over 200 people were enrolled in the chronic health condition waiver during 2015. The lowest cost waiver on a per person basis um, is the elderly waiver. It enrolled about 6,000 people at an average cost of about $9,000 per year. I have to caution you though that our data captured only a small share of the number of elderly people covered by the waiver. Most of the elderly recipients, waiver recipients, are enrolled in managed care health plans where the managed care organization, rather than the Department of Human Services, actually pays for the cost. So the costs for the elderly waiver are understated here. This slide shows how much it costs to provide the different types of services covered under home and community-based services. The majority of expenditures, as I said earlier, are for residential services. This pie chart shows that supported living services comprise 31% of home and community-based services in 2015. These services are directed at people with developmental disabilities, and they're provided either in residents' own homes or in foster care settings. Foster home and assisted living services are the next largest chunk, coming in at about 22%. These services are similar to supported living services, but they are provided to people with other types of disabling conditions. Personal care and home health services are provided largely in people's homes, and they comprised about 19% of total expenditures. All of those types of, of services, supported living, foster home, assisted living, personal care attendance, they all help recipients do um, things that many of us take for granted, get dressed in the morning, um, move about the community or move about their own homes, um, get up in the morning. 
Some of the services also try to teach recipients how to perform those um, basic daily living services themselves. Um, the other category up there coming in at 20% covers a very broad range of services. It includes things like respite care, companion services, um, vocational training. Um, it also includes some of the more medically oriented services such as licensed nurse visits or some of the occupational or physical therapies that people have. I'm not going to go into a lot of great detail about how much it costs to provide each service um, to the different populations, but I'll direct you to pages 23 and 32 of our report. We have a, a, a number of tables that show exactly what it costs to provide each service on average to recipients in the different waiver programs and under the state plan. So there's a lot of cost detail there. Thanks, Ms. Voss. And I actually just had a question about the a slide ago when I was debating if we should do questions along oh. the way. I think that we, we should if, uh, you know, we're a modest size group today. And but anyway, so if people have questions either now or later. Um, so just uh, mine, then I'll go to Senator Hoffman. Um, the cost of the elderly waiver, you said, was 8000 and something. Uh, um, and that there was some of the costs borne by managed organizations. And so was, if this is a nursing home replacement option, would those costs be ones that would be otherwise borne by a nursing home if they were in there? And do you have an idea what those might amount to? Managed care, um, Mr. Chair, data that we received from the Department of Human Services show that about 25,000 people, elderly people, received home and community-based services um, from managed care organizations at a cost of about $400 million. These are, the, these, those costs come out of the capitated rate that the department pays the managed care organizations. So, so we're looking at, you know, another 25,000 people covered by those, covered by managed care organizations and then the same types of services that are available to um, elderly waiver people enrolled in fee-for-service programs. And that would be additive, so this eight thousand, well, and then that would be an additional for, per capitation, or is that a separate 20, uh, 25,000 people? Um, Mr. Chair, it's an additional twenty-five thousand people. Although you can't add the costs onto what it's costing um, the Department of Human Services, because these costs are costs that are borne directly by the department, and when managed care organizations pay for it they pay for it out of that big amount of money the department pays them under the capitated rates. Right, and so that's a new block of 25,000 people not covered by the chart. Yes. Is that right? Okay. Yes, yes. Thank you. Senator okay. Hoffman. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. And actually, it, I, I asterisked that, and I'm glad you brought that up. Jeez. It's the Anoka <laughs> County. Yeah, I, good you know, um, In addition to that, so it, do the same... <coughs> reporting, um, regulatory reporting uh, pieces, are they the same with the managed care as they are with DHS? I mean, it seems like you can get the information from DHS, but it's like, for me, it's almost like there's this opening door that says, well, wait a minute, these 25,000 people, I can't don't have the information. Is that not a true statement? Um, Ms. Boss. Mr. Chair, Senator Hackman, they have different data collection systems for managed care and for um, the fee-for-service type arrangements. And the sys we have drew our data largely from the Minnesota Me Medicaid Management Information System, MMIS. There's an entirely new, different data system um, that's in place for managed care organizations to report data. As a follow-up, thank you, Mr. Chair. It sounds like uh, there needs to be a data conversation here as the, with the Senator Ralph and the Senator Weger, Mr. Chair. Um, but but is it, if I understand that this is, this is public money, though, that is provided to those managed health care organizations, is that correct? Um, Ms. Boss. Senator, uh, Senator Hoffman. Yes, it is public money going into that we pay as part of the capitated rate. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks. Okay, just keep going. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, now we're going to look a little bit more at how the department monitors the cost of um, providing home and community-based services. 
we have concerns that the department has inadequate tools for monitoring services when they are provided directly in recipients' own homes. Over the last several years, the department, the legislature, has adopted numerous changes to the to laws governing the PCA program, changes that were the result of some of recommendations that we made back in 2009 when we did a study of um, the PCA program. Also just other sorts of um, re recommendations that have been made by a number of other organizations such as the Inspector General and DHS itself. Over the last, since our report came out on PCAs in 2009, um, the Federal Department of Health and Human Services Office of Inspector General has found similar problems in PCA programs nationwide. So it's not just a problem that Minnesota had. And about two years ago, the Inspector General actually recommended that many, that other states adopt many of the same measures that Minnesota already has in place for its PCA program. The problem that we see is that there are other types of workers who do similar work to PCAs in recipients' own homes who aren't subject to these requirements, such as home health aides, um, companions, um, homemaking skills. And according to the federal government, in our own 2009 report on PCAs, services provided in recipients' own homes where there's less supervision, um, they are, is they, those services are especially susceptible to fraud. And so we recommended that the legislature extend what's currently in place for PCAs to other types of workers doing similar work in recipients' own homes, requiring individual workers to enroll with the Department of Human Services, limiting the number of hours they can bill for, and requiring periodic checks to make sure the work is being done. I might add that we're not alone in our concern about um, work being done in recipients' own homes. New federal requirements will be kicking in over the next two years for PCAs and over the next five years for home health workers that would require states to have some sort of electronic verification systems in place to make sure that PCA and home health aid workers are actually on the site and doing the work that they're supposed to be doing. And I know the department has been working on getting ready for that. I have to also say something about the overall framework in which home and community-based services are provided. It's a complex framework, it's a confusing framework, and to be honest, I don't know which came first, the complexity or the confusion. To begin with, the department doesn't pay for home and community-based services in the same way across all the waivers. It often depends on the type of health plan somebody is enrolled in. The same types of services are available often through the state plan and across waivers. And different terms are often used to describe the same or similar types of services. For example, foster home and supported living services, while directed at different groups of people, actually involve similar tasks but are called different things. Likewise, PCAs and home health aid workers are regulated differently called by different names, but they often do the same kinds of work. And I don't mean to blame the Department of Human Services or even the legislature for, for the confusion. One of the reasons for the confusion is that the entire home and community-based services system has evolved gradually over time. We adopted our first waiver back in the mid-1980s, and since then we've added waivers, we've added different types of activities to the program, we've taken out different types of activities, we've tinkered with and changed the names of the activities. And this is a national problem. A 2016 report by the um, United States General Accountability Office recommended that the federal government do more to standardize policies and reporting requirements across its different programs and activities. And so we think a little bit more standardization across waivers and health plans in terms of the menu of services and reporting requirements would make the system a whole lot easier to understand both for policymakers and the general public. One way we might be able to do this is to look at whether it's possible to combine our five waivers into a single waiver with a, and offer a single set or menu of services to eligible participants. 
Over the last several years, the legislature or the federal government has given states a great deal of flexibility in how they, um, how they deliver their uh, home and community-based service program. And we think we need to explore this a little bit more. I know that the governor in his um, budget proposal this last year recommended that the department hire an outside consultant to study whether or not it's a good idea to combine at least the four disability-based waivers into a single waiver. Finally, um, as part of our evaluation, we asked counties, we asked some counties, some providers, some advocacy organizations about the biggest problems facing the home and community-based service system question. <laughs> okay. Uh, going back to the visitation, um, the whole thing about the different names, one of the things that pops is um, the Fed 21st Century Cures Act. Mm -hmm. Did you take a look at that to see if that electronic verification would possibly um, be satisfactory toward uh, the regu regulation of the visits? Did you guys take a look at that at all? Um, Ms. Boss. Mr. Chair, Senator Hoppen, we didn't look a great deal at what the um, what the new the the uh, electronic verification systems would look like. I know that when we talked to some providers, they already use some systems. Um, I know the department is has been holding a series of meetings with providers and and the public to try to get more information, but we didn't look at it in any more detail than noting that it's. Coming on board. So it sounds like there might be some more state regulation that's going to be needed uh, to be added to that if, that, if, if that's the case. I, Is that a good Yes, I, Senator Hoffman, I suspect so. All right, thank you. Um, after we talked with providers and counties and things about the biggest problems, um, their biggest concern centered around a, a kind of a cluster of related workforce issues. First, there are the simple demographic changes occurring. Fewer people entering the workforce. Um, it's growing, the number of people entering the workforce is growing at a slower rate than the number of people who are likely going to be needing services from that workforce. According to the state demographer, 10 years following 2019 will be the most severe in terms of labor shortages in Minnesota. Second, Wages aren't high for some types of home and community-based service workers, um, especially PCAs and home health aid workers who do the bulk of um, the work in residential settings. Average hourly wage rates for these workers are higher in Minnesota than, uh, than in most other states, but they're still not high. Across all healthcare settings in Minnesota in 2015, PCAs, home health aids made somewhere between 11.50 and 12.50 an hour. Being a direct care worker in a home and community-based service setting is not easy work. It's, it can be very demanding both physically and mentally, um, again, for relatively low wages. We talked with a number of providers who said, hey, look, we have a hard time competing with the Super America down the street for workers because they often pay about the same or better wages, and the work is a whole lot easier, and it's true. Um, these all contribute to providers having problems finding enough workers to even take care of their current um, needs. And it's going to get worse as time progresses. And so we recommend that um, the legislature direct the department to periodically collect data on staffing specific to home and community-based service settings. Things like the number of direct care workers employed, what their average hourly wages are, um, turnover among staff. We think this kind of targeted information is going to be necessary for state policymakers to develop appropriate strategies to address workforce issues and that will be confronting the, the system in the future. The information will also be needed to sort of um, assess the impact of whatever changes the legislature or policymakers decide to make. A number of organizations have made similar recommendations on both the state and a national level, and I know that the governor proposed something similar to this um, in his budget proposal. Senator Ralph. <laughs> I'm new to this game. Uh, and 
one of the things that struck me from the very beginning is everyone is simply saying, look, we've got a shortage. And we, 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 we know we have a shortage. Mm -hmm. And so my concern is if we, we are collecting this data, which I think is probably going to tell us what we already know, my concern is, is that we'd be starting to look for outside the box uh, ways to find and encourage people to come to work in this area. I mean, you put your finger right on two problems. It's difficult work and we don't pay enough. And it seems that what we need to know is ways to actually solve that issue. Uh, obviously, we need to know information on wages across the country and wh what the trend is, and that would be important information. But. I think one of the things that we need to be focusing on, and we do have a working group uh, focused on this, we'll be just starting up in a, in a month or so, but that's in a very narrow area. Um, so I guess in these recommendations, my question to you is, is there other ways that data could be collected and shared that would lead to answers to how we solve this? Not just to know that we have a problem, but would actually lead to answers. Ms. Foss. Mr. Chair, Senator Ralph. I think part of the um, attractiveness to collecting data such as what we got, got up there on the slide is that we need baseline data in order to say whether or not whatever strategies you decide to adopt are actually working or not because you, know, you could tinker around or you could make major changes but you're not going to know if actually if um, turnover is decreasing or um, we're paying higher wages until you collect that baseline data. So I think it's useful to get information on not only to help design your strategy, but also to just help determine whether or not it's working. Senator Roth. Here, Ms. Voss. Um, my question then, again, as a follow-up is, in, in examining some other data questions that we had during the year last year, we found that in many cases this data is actually being collected. It's just not being shared. And I guess the, the follow-up question is, is there a way we can get at that? I, I'm trying to streamline. I'm trying to help, help the department so it doesn't have to add another layer. And if this data is already being collected somewhere, shouldn't we be looking for that? Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Ralph, um, I guess I have two, two responses. We're saying that the DHS should be required to periodically collect. We're not saying annually collect this information. And we did talk with some other um, agencies that collect the data, for example, um, the Department of um, Economic Development and Employment. And the data that they collect, they're not amenable to actually looking specifically at home and community-based services. They either don't collect enough information um, or they collect it only on a sample of of um, providers every couple of years. So I, I, we could not find data that were, um, I guess, adequate to actually target our, our strategies to home and health care services. So is that? Uh... And, and that, I guess, is, the, is our study in a sort of a nutshell. Um, I know that we have the department's response in the back of the report, and I know they're here to respond to it, but if there are more questions, I'd be happy to take them. I do have one more, and it's okay. actually this, the same topic as my first one about the elderly waiver and then the managed mm -hmm. care component. Um, as I <clears throat> kind of ruminated there, it seems as though the managed care component is close to 16,000 per capita compared to mm -hmm. 8,000 in the elderly waiver, formal waiver part. Right. Is that a different kind of population? Are they doing more things, or do you not know what they're doing with the 16,000 compared to the eight? Mr. Chair, I don't know what they're doing exactly with the 16,000. It could be that there are different types of people enrolled in different types of programs because the level of need varies greatly within each of the waiver types. All right, so maybe the department can just be advised. I'm curious about that when they present. Uh, Senator Kiffmeyer, welcome to the, welcome. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good to be in the chair again and on this subject. So Ms. Voss, the question I have for you, we're not gonna be able to multiply more people. There is a number of people and everybody's out there competing for them, whether it's manufacturing, um, service industry, and so on. But what you do see amongst these areas is augmenting them. So sometimes it's a robotics, sometimes in manufacturing a little bit more. 
uh, other ways, it's, uh, it, there are just a whole bunch of things. In this area, it is very people-centered, uh, but we're gonna run into that. In the process of doing all of this, did you find some technical tools or other kinds of ways? What we're trying to do here is do, keep doing the same thing in the same way, but more efficient. Maybe it is time to look at, is there a different way to accomplish the same goal, mm -hmm. not necessarily in the same way? So in the process of doing a lot of this research, did you find information in regards to that? Ms. Voss. Mr. Chair, Senator Kiffmeyer, we did not look specifically at how the services are actually provided <coughs> in terms of you know the mechanics of it, and that was beyond the scope of the report. Okay. Senator Kiffmeyer. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think it's important for us to keep this in mind, though, mm -hmm. that 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 exactly was their charge, but our charge is a little bit different. We're more goal-oriented to meet the need, but it may be in a different way, and I think we ought to consider that. I mean, this is making what is there more efficient, more factual, and the data is very important um, no matter what. Thank you. Senator Kiffmeyer, I think um, part of our value is that we sort of put a price tag on the different kinds of services, and I think it's useful because one could look at some of the most costly ones and say, well, is there another way we can provide it? Where would we get the biggest bang for our buck? Right. Very good. Thank you. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Going back to the workforce issues, the, when you found that there was 1150 to 1250 per hour providing the support services needed within this waiver, the structured mm -hmm. waiver services. Did you take a look at uh, the structure of the reimbursement rate or the reimbursement rates and how how they lay out and, and is there a table someplace we could get that? Because my assumption is the, the their, their rate is based upon the rate that they get reimbursed. So anything we start to talk about on the state level or local level is gonna definitely affect. And I know, I know anecdotally, uh, the nursing providers that do the in-home, whether it be the services to youth, birth to three, and, and, and on up to adults, their reimbursement rate is not the same as the reimbursement rate would be if they were providing the services at a clinic-based or, or an institutional setting. So can you help us see that picture? Uh, Ms. Voss. Mr. Chair, Senator Hoffman, the data that we have on wages is our um, statewide data for personal care attendance services, home health services, across all types of healthcare industries in Minnesota. It's not just home and community-based services. The, um, real, the rate payment, the rates set by the Department of Human Services um, that went into effect in 2014 um, are based on wages paid in, I believe, in 2014 and they were set to be updated, I believe, this coming year. They're, the legislation required them to update the wage, the wage rate that they use to calculate the payment system um, this coming year. So there's, there is a somewhat of a lag in, in what is paid, the wage rate that the department uses to determine the rates it pays home and community-based service providers. Sarah. As we investigate further, just you know, mm -hmm. what are we going to do in order to try to close this gap of, of services providing without looking like we did 50 years ago? Mm -hmm. and, and and you know, when you go back to why waivers were existed prior to 1991, your services were only paid on the Medicaid side yeah. if those services were provided in a state institution. And I don't think we want to see ourselves going back to that. But yet at the same time, I think we need to really look at our rate. I think you used the word rate methodology. There you go, Alex. <laughs> Jim. Geez. That was funny. That was funny. That was, I mean, they're all walking the same walk together. So uh, mm -hmm. it's been good information from you. So thank you. And so, Ms. Voss, um, this also is kind of thinking the charge of your evaluation. Did you um, look at variations uh, between similar recipients in different places and between, from county to county and like that? Or do you just kind of took it face value that whatever they were awarded was valid for a for like a, a need level? Like somebody um, in Cushing County got evaluated mm -hmm. and they have a their certain profile and then the same individual down in Dakota County. Did you look at that at uh, all? Mr. Chair, we do not look at whether or not <clears throat> services actually fit the people that 
receiving those services, whether or not they were getting the right services, right. or whether or not counties varied substantially in in the different types of services they offered the same kind of person. All right, thank you. Well, I appreciate that, and so uh, you can, uh, then now we'll have uh, Ms. Bartolet come up. And depending upon how this goes for time and everything, at some point we might have a dialogue, and we might not, just depending with the various witnesses. So thank you very much, Ms. Voss, for your thank work. You. And uh, next we can get the report to us. <clears throat> Too much technology. <laughs> Is there such a thing? <laughs> oh, that's that that's funny. Um <laughs> While you're setting up your technology, we were at the MAXA meeting this morning and <clears throat> looking at some of the success stories about Minnesota's efforts at technology. And uh, we're still trying to find a successful one. So we, we talked about, actually Health Match came up, which I always generates a chuckle from people who remember that. And uh, Matt's, and now if you want to go get your car tabs. And, um, <clears throat> you know. <laughs> Maybe states shouldn't design their own computer software, but Miss uh, Ham, maybe you can invest, inspect that sometime. Uh, so now we're going to hear from the department when they uh, uh, get squared away, and there's a PowerPoint about that too, I guess. And you're doing a joint uh, presentation. Okay, yes. great. And so just as we're still sitting here, um, going forward, um, my plan for the session in terms of this, if we can get a product out of this that seems to be a consensus, uh, that would be useful. I'm happy to advance that, which I think it's a good idea if we can, can call um, from Larissa. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I have no sons at home that could come help you with this. So, yeah, they <laughs> Where's the 14 year olds when you need them? But anyway, so if we can find uh, some consensus points that make sense, um, and uh, just to kind of even preamble the presentation, chatting ahead of time, so we've done a lot of regulation of a lot of groups back. over time, and some of that regulation is totally valuable and useful, and some of it's totally pointless, and some of it actually causes harm to providers that are doing a good job. And so. I think we need to, at some point, draw a line of what we consider to be the lowest level of competency and call that okay, 30 percentile or something. And everybody below that is going to be in doing not okay, and everybody above that is all right. And, and people decide what that line is, and then, <clears throat> then we can really pound on those who are either kick them out or make them comply. and then the best we can, leave alone the providers that are doing generally what we had in mind. Um, <clears throat> when it came to the Affordable Care Act, they were kind of bullish on exchanges. I used Massachusetts as a working, as a model of that. Well, here's an example, oh, bipartisan, whatever. And so when the dust settled, the Massachusetts connector did not qualify <laughs> as an exchange. They had to modify their functionality and actually went out of business. So. That's the caveat on all this oversight that I carry with me. And so we chatted about that a bit, Ms. Ham. So I just thought I'd tell it to the people and be part of my presentation today. So now it's your turn. And uh, welcome to the committee, Ms. Bartolak, too. Sounds Thank you looks very like you're much, starting. Mr. Chair. I'm Alex Bartolak with the Department of Human Services. And I'm going to begin this, and we're going to be following up, uh, starting from a policy perspective and then working into the Office of Inspector General and some of the other activities that have been going on. I first want to thank the, uh, the legislative auditor for this thorough evaluation. Uh, they brought up many points that you have heard that we have been discussing over time. Uh, we find ourselves primarily in alignment with the findings and wanting to be able to make some changes as we go forward. We've done some things, and you did some things last session that were implemented that are directly responsive. So we want to be able to talk about where we are and where we're going. 
Um, jo did a great job of walking through what are home and community-based services and the fact that this is a category that's fairly broad. It includes waivers as well as home care. And just to remember that home care has different kinds of credentialing and, um, and payment and authorization processes than under the waivers. She did a good review, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, other than to just reinforce the fact that these are the services that have really enabled people with disabilities and people who are older to live in their communities, to work, to be able to stay at home with families. These are the critical infrastructure that has allowed Minnesota to move uh, from an institutional system. There were the three uh, recommendations that came out of the report looking at how to increase regulation over direct care workers, collecting data, and being able to have a common set of uh, financial reporting and a menu of services. Where are we today? First of all, just to pause and remember that three decades ago, we had the highest per capita use of institutional care of any state in the country. We had the highest number of beds and the highest use of people in nursing homes, highest use of people in intermediate care facilities for people with developmental disabilities. And we have since that time moved our system to where 94% of people with disabilities are living in their homes, they're living in communities and being able to be with family and friends and working. Uh, we have over half of the seniors that are able to live at home. So this system has made dramatic changes over time, and it's supporting people in really important ways. And we've been recognized. We've been rated number one in the country for our long-term services and supports um, by the AARP and SCAN Foundation, in part because of the investments we've made to really move from an institutional setting to support people. And it's also helped us because it's a more cost-effective way of providing people than continuing to rely on institutional care. But we do have to acknowledge that with a lot of that change, closure of the state institutions, closure of many of the privately owned nursing homes and intermediate care facilities really led to a lot of growing pains. So that would mean that sometimes a facility would close fairly quickly. Providers were trying to figure out how to support people, how to share costs. So we did start seeing some reliance on certain models, such as foster care situations, because we could do it quickly and we could afford it as a system. So that was responding to much of that. Now we're in a process of trying to really support more um, individualized arrangements. One, because we can't afford to maintain the staffing in some of these settings that we've had before, but also because people are wanting different things and how can we really be responsive and really look at ways of using technology or other resources in the community in different ways. And you all know that certainly with our Olmstead plan, there's a lot of activities that have been set out in there that eight state agencies have committed to doing to assure that housing is available, to talk about technology, to talk about ways we can work on employment and education. So this is a concerted effort. Medicaid cannot fix all these issues. We need to make sure we're really working more broadly. Uh, there was a highlighting of the workforce challenge, so I just wanted to highlight it again, uh, that this is important. One of the things that I think is a really scary statistic, and we don't have to always admire it, we do have ideas to move forward, but in the decade starting in 1990, we had 38,000 people annually entering the labor market. Right now, in this decade, we have 8,000. Next decade, 4,000. We really, literally do not have people to continue services the way we have been. We absolutely have to look at ways that technology can support people differently. We have to be able to really look at some different options, and that's scary, and it takes a lot of creativity, and it's really hard to figure out how to manage some of the risk and come at this differently, and so that has been one thing we've been putting a lot of resources into. How could we actually change the models and the way we deliver services? We also know that we need to incent people and support people to be in the market. I mean, if we talk about fraud, that's often people who aren't well trained, who haven't had an investment in being in there. How do we not only match pay, but match it with training, with longevity, with people who are able to do really good outcomes, career ladders. But the other word we talk about is lattices. Not everybody needs to move on to a different type of career. Some people like being direct support workers. And how can we actually really enable um, uh, support them in doing that. 
We also need data. We do not have the right kind of data. And I think it's more than collecting data for data's sake, because you're right. We could collect it and admire the situation. But you know what? We have a lot of providers who are doing different things. We have families and people who use services that have a lot of ideas about how they could use it differently and better. If we had better data, we could start matching up. This kind of training actually makes a difference in outcomes. Or these providers have invested in this type of activity, and how can we really make those investments to support that in different ways. So we, we need to be able to understand uh, what is happening and the types of outcomes we're getting. We know that people have choices in the types of services, and we know it's not unlimited choices. We all have constraints on our choices, whether it's financial, whether it's the implications that other people have on there. Um, there's a number of parameters, and this continues to create a lot of dynamics about where is the system going. So the federal government said, you know what, we're going to set some limits on where people can live in order to receive home and community-based services, and we're trying to work on how do we really support people in living in their communities. If we rely on paid support to be all that people have, and we wrap 24-hour support around people, one, we can't afford to do it, but also that might not be the best way of helping people really be engaged in their community. So how do we talk about what's available and looking at different kind of outcomes? We also know our reforms take time. Some of you have been here for a while trying to reform how we assess, standards, how we develop rates. They take time to work through. This is a complicated system that has really developed over a significant period of time. And some of the fixes that would be easy are actually quite complicated when you actually play it out across tens of thousands of people and thousands of providers trying to, trying to manage it. So we want to be able to really use um, data to evaluate the outcomes and really figure out where assessment, our investments make the biggest difference. There have been a number of changes that have been going on. We've been uh, managing growth of corporate foster care. We've been able to see where we had 41% of people going into group homes at one point. We're now down to 29%. So we are seeing different ways of delivering services coming out. This has been at um, a lower cost per person, and it has its challenges. But we also have seen a lot of innovative things coming out on how we could uh, support services differently. We have a rate system um, that before counties negotiated rates individually and we did not have a systemic way of understanding what were costs, what were reimbursements, and what were the outcomes. And so it's a process. We're going to keep working through it. But it does tell us what we are paying for, what the cost should be, and are we getting some of the outcomes. So that has been one thing. We've had common licensure. We actually have had a common menu of services. The legislature required us to do it. What we found is that when different services were in different programs, they had different average rates of reimbursement. If we truly go to a common service menu, we either are going to have to reduce some rates or increase some rates. That's pretty complicated. So what we're trying to do is make sure people get access to any service. I will say it's probably just time to revamp our entire service menu because it has grown over time. But there's some complexities in trying to make things simpler. We also know that a lot of the... Half the audience just fainted when you said that, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just one more reform. <laughs> How hard can that be? Uh, we'll, have to have a, we'll probably need a hearing on that, at least one. So, go ahead. Um, we also know that in institutional services, housing, food, and services are packaged together. In home and community-based services, they're not. And if people can't afford to live in a house, or if they don't have transportation, that's really going to affect their services. So uh, there's been housing support reform to really enable people to afford housing. Um, and there's a lot more we can talk about that, but that's taking our GRH and MSA, some of those different funding streams, and having them be available in a different way. Where are we going? Um, some of the changes in process, we have new employment services that were authorized uh, to allow those people who want to work the chance to work. This is important to give people disposable income, but also to support their services in a different way. We have different ways of supporting people who are living in their own home, new services. Uh, we're looking at different ways of getting plain language material. DHS has worked through counties and through health plans, and all of us in a time of extreme change need a common vocabulary. So we've been doing a lot of focus groups and ways of saying, 
How do we take this three-page thing we used to talk to you about and make it easy to understand, perhaps, in one page? And then also a number of changes have been made to put system edits in the system in places where they weren't before. Where are we going? Um, and that has been addressed a little bit here. Uh, we have several studies going on. So whether consolidating the waivers is the right answer, but we know that there probably are ways we could administer our services in a different way that could be more streamlined and more efficient. And we're looking forward to getting some feedback on that. Uh, we do have um, the ability to collect cost data from providers, and so we are in the process of setting that up. Our goal is to make it so it's not um, a burden, but it, it gives us important information. It would be on a rolling basis, so every provider would do it every five years when they go re-enroll with the Medicaid program, and over time we would be having a lot of really good information. We're looking at individualized budgeting. What is the right amount of service for a person? How do we put some parameters on spending? Um, what happens in establishing budgets for people if they want to direct their own service? So we have uh, some information on that which will help us think about how we manage this. We've been looking at different ways of doing edits. So for example, providers for some services were able to bill for a block of a month, and now it's breaking it down to billing for a day, so we understand that, such as home delivered meals. And as was mentioned, we have been working uh, with a number of stakeholders um, on electronic service documentation systems, EVV, electronic visit verifications. There are systems out there. There's a number of providers who have systems. What we actually require are how we implement it and what is it going to take to implement it are the things we're working on to give you a report this legislative session so you have some information on some next steps to take. Um, I am, also I just wanted to point out we had two pieces of legislation that did not pass but were responsive to some of the OLA recommendations. One was on collecting how to document the provision of services so that there is a trail of understanding what services were actually delivered. And the other one is getting workforce data. We can get cost reporting data from our home and community-based service providers. Workforce data is trying to look a little bit broader across the workforce of a number of different industries that are paid for out of medical assistance so we can really understand the changes that are going on and use that to understand when providers or systems have put in different incentives or have different outcomes, what's the correlation so we really understand um, how to inform future policy decisions. So I'm going to pause there I, uh, and turn it over to my colleague who is going to be able to address the steps that the Office of Inspector General has been taken. Give you a chance to catch up there. And so let's discuss uh, some of the department uh, testimony. Are there any questions from members? I've got a handful, but Senator Kiffmeyer. Mr. Chair, and good to see you, Ms. Bartolik. Um, <clears throat> it was interesting in your opening comments, uh, kind of what I was kind of saying before. And so it was good to hear that affirmed. Probably one of the things I have for you as well, in the process of looking at this, realizing that workforce is an issue, um, is there any study, uh, work group, or anything going on on the augmentation of technology or other things like that to help in regards to the pressure on the workforce? Ms. Bartolik. Mr. Chair and Senator Kiffmeyer, that's a really good question, and yes. So we've been working with providers on the type of technology through a series of work groups and also practice <coughs> as they've been trying things that can allow technology to perhaps substitute or augment staff so that they can use people where they really need people. Mm -hmm. We also were given a grant funding by the legislature starting a few years ago to look at doing how to do different kinds of assessment for technology to really go and understand from a person's perspective what could help them and we've been able to use technology to help people move out of nursing homes, out of hospitals, out of foster care settings into their own homes where technology has actually allowed their services to be not all the time, it's allowed it to be very affordable and it's given people a great degree of um, 
of independence. We also, through our Olmstead plan, have a technology focus. So this is eight state agencies, um, as well as others coming together to say, what do we need to do? So we've been working with the Department of Education, for example, to understand how can we better bridge as students are using technology or what technology could assist them in transitioning, use some of that to manage it differently. There's resource uh, settings, I know that. We have one that's going up through the STAR program, which is a state program to look at how we can use resources. ARM's been putting up a great resource for providers on helping them think about it. There's a lot of energy in this area. There's a lot of activity. And I think there's going to be more recommendations coming out of this of what we could do to change our what we pay for and how we make access to technology a little more seamless. Ms. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think one other thing. Um, in meeting individually with people and other kinds of conversations, uh, they become aware of like when you see the average or the mean data, and they say, oh my gosh, they're spending that much money. And they sometimes feel like where it's spent isn't where they really want it spent. And I think that concept of um, if they're allocated some dollars, they'd like to choose and prioritize those things that really mean a lot to them, either give them quality of life, really meet a need and not have, it was encouraging to me, they didn't want to see us spend money on things that really weren't of, of what they consider a priority or value to them. Have you heard the same thing and is there any uh, direction in regards to that as well? Ms. Bartolik. Mr. Chair, we do see the same thing and actually most people want the services to go. I mean, we've had situations when there's been discussions of different reductions, and people have talked about how they could get less in order, in order to serve other people who weren't getting anything. Mm -hmm. So I do think that we're Minnesota. I think there's an effort for a common good. We are hoping that some of the study and information we get from that study on individualized budgeting, what is a reasonable amount to support a service plan, will give us some guideline to say, okay, here's the parameters of what would be reasonable to spend. You make choices. And then we have to figure out, are there different ways to incent people or reward them for making choices that actually save less money? Could parents who are able to figure something out different for a child be able to reserve an account? Or is there a chance to use some of the state share of the dollars in a different way that we might not be able to with Medicaid so that we're all finding a way to share some of the um, benefits of that. But we're very interested in helping people know what money's going in there. There's a dad who I see about once a month and he always says, my son was not having a $75,000 a year life, so we got involved and we gave him one, um, about what they were purchasing and doing and they really came up with some great ways of, of uh, giving services in a different way. Very good, thank you. Uh, you know, and to that point, uh, Ms. Bartolik, um, it seems, I mean, here's what people like me think goes on, um, that we don't have to have a sentence like, oh, now we're going to look and see what they really would have liked. But I, we think that the local case manager or whomever is actually interacting with the family and the individual. And we have consumer directed, they can kind of do what they want more there. But, it, but deep down, they're kind of all getting what they would have liked and need. And so if there's services that people are getting that they consider pointless, that would be headline news to me, it seems. That would be like the system has not functioned like it should have, and we're just, just you're awarded through this system we have that we'll talk about this afternoon uh, that says you get you know, six hours a day or something, and, and uh, by gum, we're gonna spend those six hours, whether we need them or not, or we're gonna take the value of that and buy something. And, um, I, having just left Maxa this morning, it seems as though they would think that they are hoping that everything they spend is of value and not a surprise to somebody. And so, do you really think that there's some people who are getting things that they don't value and even want? I, I, I'm trying to say it nice. I yeah. just, it, it just, it, I, I was just surprised how that kind of came out to how it, you said it and how it hit me. So, Mr. Chair, there are people who are getting services that they very much need. There are, and I think all of that's happening, but we are having people who have different outcomes that they want. They might want, not want to live in that particular setting. 
They might want a job. They might want to be at home more with their family. We have children where families are having different things that they're interested in doing than some of the traditional services. So we have done a, ve a very good job of providing services to meet people's needs, and we should be proud of it. But as we're having changing expectations, and as we have workforce shortages where people are not able to get the kind of consistent support that they want, we are having people say, I think I could do it differently. Um, in the example I gave you, it was a situation where they were concerned about turnover of staff. They weren't feeling that their son was um, really engaging with friends, and they had some different ways of doing it. It was the same provider who actually, just working with the family, was able to do some different things. So I'm sorry if my comment made it sound <laughs> as though the services aren't delivering good outcomes. They are. But we're at a cusp where we can ask different questions and we can talk about different options in a different way. Um, and, and we're seeing a lot of innovation with providers. So how do we support that? How do we incent that? Um, and also we have a lot of people who don't always have the time just because of a lot of busyness to understand what all the different options are. And that's one thing we're trying as a system to make sure people can have deeper conversations and look at some different options. You know, I appreciate that. And at the end, an individual who's getting served that has a strong network of friendly or family advocates is going to be much happier with their package than if they're just, if they have nobody. But, mm -hmm. you know, then they're, it just it seemed like, you're assigned to some services, and uh, I, I appreciate that. And I just want to remind people that this last session we worked very well with the department uh, on creating a policy where people are even more encouraged to move to independent living, and where the state is taking over some more active management of those uh, of the beds, and uh, and that the uh, MSOC's uh, focus is to be based in their at least in their policy more on people with behavioral challenges and and that they're supposed to give some priority to that. And so uh, this is very much a partnership. And, and everybody at this table, and I'm sure in the room and at that table, cares a lot about the people we're serving. And how do we do that well with uh, all the players we have? That's the ongoing challenge. And Mr. Chair, could I just make one comment to follow up on that? You made a really important statement that there's, we serve tens of thousands of people. Some people have strong family engagement. Some people live in communities where their friends and neighbors are all around them. And some people are very isolated and don't have anyone else to speak on their behalf. So also part of the challenge is making sure that we are representing and providing services that can address all of their needs. We are not assuming that some people um, that some of these options would work for everybody. That is not the case. Well, very good. So uh, thanks for all that. And, um, and uh, you know, uh, just to defend the department a little bit, you know, from me, we, we all mean well, and um, it is a partnership. And we, we, we try to sharpen each other, I think. And I, think I think that um, when people remember that as they are sitting in the chairs in the audience, which represents two dozen different uh, um, aspects of the implementation part and people listen at home with their particular child or loved one. and um, We are all trying to do the same thing and we very much need their advice and there's good ways we can change over that. So anyway, uh, to the accountability side and what happens when it goes wrong side, uh, Ms. Ham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, as you can probably tell, I am not Jerry Kerber. I am Carolyn Ham. I am the second Inspector General for the state of Minnesota. And I thought I might just share a little bit of my background with you just so you have a sense of uh, where my expertise lies. Uh, I am a former prosecutor with the Attorney General's Office as well as Ramsey County. But for the last decade, I was at Optum and I was assisting in their payment integrity efforts. At Optum, we managed to save over a billion dollars um, from healthcare dollars. And so uh, this is an area that I'm quite familiar with, although the nuance is clearly uh, lots of learning. I was with Jo um, when she said that some of the terminology is confusing. It took me a long time to understand there's PCA and there's HCBS? What? I, I don't, so I, I appreciate um, all the uh, efforts that the department has done, agencies done to help bring me along. Uh, and with that, I will turn to our presentation. 
So as you may know, we have our financial uh, fraud and abuse investigations division, and uh, one of the aspects of that division is looking at providers who are billing in the Medicaid space. Uh, and we also have a different division, which we'll be talking about tomorrow, uh, which looks at our child care assistance program. Uh, we also are oversee our efforts in looking at recipients or applicants for public benefits when there's a suspicion or questionable eligibility. So um, we look at all of the different providers in the $12 billion uh, Medicaid industry that is in Minnesota. There are over 100 different provider types. Um, uh, however, right now we have 16 investigators to look at all of those providers. Thanks to the generosity of the legislature last session, we do have an additional 10 positions that we are currently listing and hoping to fill very soon. And I promise you we will be able to keep them very busy. Uh, so I think that this is really helpful for you because uh, since the topic today is PCA fraud, if you look at this chart, this is looking at where do we, where have most of our investigations, which kinds of providers, and as you can see, the personal care provider is overwhelmingly uh, in the majority in terms of who we're looking at. It's more than 50%. So if we think about, uh, you know, what are some of the common schemes that we see in the PCA world uh, in fraud, it can begin at the very onset, which is that there's falsification of the need for the services. Uh, you can also have collusion or coercion between the recipient and the worker where they will, um, perhaps they'll split the cost of what they're getting for taking care of them. Uh, sometimes the collusion can come in if the provider, excuse me, if the recipient has particular difficulty getting a person to care for them. Uh, because maybe they have difficult needs, whatnot, they may agree to say, okay, I know you're only gonna watch work for me for two hours, but yes, I'll sign off on four because otherwise you're not gonna stay with me and I need somebody to take care of me. So that's an example where there can be the collusion. There can also be uh, identity theft of the recipient, but not only the recipient, it can also be the PCA agent or perhaps the qualified professional or the nurse, um, there can be forgery in any of those kinds of uh, documentations with regard to need. Uh, we can have uh, ones that are a little bit easier to find, and that's like when a PCA agent or a PCA is billing for services when it's impossible because the recipient is uh, in an inpatient setting, or uh, perhaps the recipient is outside of the country, or uh, at least outside of the state. So those are instances that are more easily verified and uh, determined, but certainly um, we still have to know to look and where to look. We can also have uh, PCA, PCAs who are saying that they're caring for a person, and then when we look at their uh, employment records, they're actually doing an eight-hour job somewhere else. Clearly they can't and the, during the same period. Clearly that can't be happening, uh, and so we have fraud in that instance. So just to give you a sense of the numbers, we had 189 cases last year that um, ha specifically focused on PCAs. We identified 1.4 million in overpayments, and 42% uh, of those cases, we either terminated the person, suspended them, uh, there was a conviction, or we had some kind of a provider agreement. Uh, as you can see then, all the other types, we had 172 cases, and only 13% of those resulted in some kind of uh, formal action. So um, what, I, what I'm very excited about is this chance to have the addition, when we will have the additional staff, uh, we will be able to expand the types of uh, investigations we're doing as well as the numbers. Um, and so we're very appreciative of the additional funding. So when we think about from the accountability side, um, we have a, a few concerns. And um, one, uh, when we look at, as Alex and Joe uh, outlined, there are different services that are being used here, or being uh, provided. And not all of them pose the same risk of fraud as others. 
And so um, it is not necessarily uh, a great idea to have everybody have to be enrolled within the, the Medicaid system. Uh, it could be quite burdensome and may not actually end up helping. Uh, I believe it was Joe that also pointed out that we are most concerned with services that are provided in the home because there is that lack of supervision and the most opportunity for fraud. And um, the other piece that we are quite concerned about is that um, we can have abuse, neglect, financial exploitation by family members um, you know, in these situations. And uh, so it's another reason why we want to have good oversight into what exactly are the services being rendered in the home. Um, so we, uh, Alex touched on the first one we're talking about here, but one of the recommendations of the OLA, uh, which we, were, we are in complete agreement with, and in fact did propose legislation last year, would be to require that services that are rendered in the uh, HCBS program have to actually be documented um, in terms of what people are doing. Um, Right now, we have very little ability to go after uh, a person that we suspect of fraud uh, for, uh, we, can't, we can't say, well, you didn't document your services. It's not a requirement. Uh, the, the best instance we could do something is when we can categorically show that person couldn't have provided the services because they were out of the country, they were at their job or whatnot. But if it comes down to trying to say, well, we think you didn't provide the services, they don't have to have any requirements to show that what they were doing. And so we strongly support uh, the OLA's recommendation on that. And in fact, as I say, we did propose, DHS did propose the legislation. Uh, the other legislation that we did introduce last year has to do with um, recipients who have um, been shown to actually be colluding with, uh, with a PCA, uh, particularly getting a kickback we would propose that we be permitted to put them into our restricted recipient program. Uh, you may, you're probably familiar with that, but uh, that would make the person um, have to go through a primary care provider and they could only see people that the primary care provider agreed upon and we think that that would go a long way towards at least limiting that particular person's ability to seek the kickbacks and whatnot. And those are that concludes my remarks. So happy to take questions. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much for the information. It's um, uh, good to hear that, um, a lot of good things. A question I have for you is, when you're mentioning documentation, so generally the PCAs or these levels of providers are maybe in a person's home. Are you saying that, I mean, in order to do billing, there should be some sort of submission from the actual person to the agency that gets that data for payment. That is a fairly normal documentation process. Is that not existing? And usually in that situation, you would have um, the ability to have the time started, time ended, what was done any notes or so on, and that that would be required for um, getting billing paid. Ms. Hamm. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Kiffmeyer. Um, in the, if, it's, if, if, if it's a PCA who's operating outside of the wavered services, they would have to have those documentation. They could, when they started, all those things. That is not present in the wavered services. Not present Senator in Kiffmeyer. The, not present in the what again? Waiver, oh. in the wavered services side. If it's fee for service under Medicaid, then yeah. they have to document that. But if it's in the wavered services, it's a different documentation requirement. So that's, that's that news to me, I guess. But. So Mr. Chair, in wavered services, that would be an agency uh, providing it or something like that? Ms. Ham. More of an organization? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? When you talk about wavered services, then those wavered services, are they provided through an agency? There's REM, there's Dakota Services, there's a variety of them, but they usually are business and they are often incorporated. 
Ms. Are you Hamm. saying that they have no documentation or are not required to have it? Ms. Ham. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Kiffmeyer. That's correct. So uh, for ser wavered service providers, the agency that's providing the service, so whoever ultimately, they do have to be licensed within uh, the state, and um, but they would not have to have those documentation requirements that we just mentioned. Mr. Chair. Ms. Senator Kiffmeyer. Well, then how do they bill? I mean, is there just a presumption or there's an authorization and then presumption, no documentation? That, that just seems really, no wonder it's an issue. <laughs> Ms. Ham, do you want to elaborate on that? So, so, and we're going to hear from the providers that are going to come up okay. and so we can maybe just delve into that a bit more. Uh, Senator Ralph, did you have a question? Uh, Same thing. You know, I had thought that they would, any, anybody that provided a service that was unsupervised would have to provide some sort of evidence of what they provided so they could get paid. And uh, how, and I, I guess I didn't catch the answer, or maybe there wasn't one, how do they get paid? In other words, are they paid on an hourly basis and they simply say, I worked seven hours today and they don't have to say where or what, or what is the, what is the basis for payment? Well, we'll I think we'll... Uh, so we'll put that question aside and then uh, we'll take that up in a minute. Um, do you have any other questions? Yes, I have a couple of others. Uh, uh, thank yeah, you, Mr. Sure. Chair. First of all, um, in, this, in these areas of fraud that you were talking about, is, is uh, PCAs, are they, are they allowed to work on their own? In other words, a person simply enters the market as a, as a, as a provider or are they generally uh, or, or are they, do they have to go through some sort of a, of an, uh, of a, of a business, uh, so to speak? Uh, Ms. Hammer, Ms. Bartolik, maybe you just want to address that. Yeah, Mr. Yeah. Chair, um, so but, uh, pers personal care assistance, which is, so we're not talking about waiver services, that those programs, those providers for the most part are licensed, they have supervisors, they do training, and that has, and there's licensors who go in. For the personal care program, they do have to go through a competency-based orientation program and show that they've met it. They have to pass a background check. There are certain training requirements that the provider organization assures have been met. And then there is what we call a qualified professional. It's a nurse who is responsible to go with them to the home, make sure that they understand what's needed to be done for that person, and then offer some periodic supervision of it. But because they're often there with people for, for you know, 40 hours a week or whatever it might be, they do deliver, once they've reached a certain level of, yes, you've had this training and we've verified certain things, they are able to work without supervision and just having the periodic monitoring. So then, uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So then, in terms of them receiving compensation, either do they, do, where do they, do they directly bill then to the department or what happens? I mean, I'm very concerned about this because some of our most disabled population are totally dependent on, on this type of service. And uh, I'm concerned, number one, about the possibility of fraud because obviously you're dealing with a very vulnerable person. And secondly, just about the efficiencies of the delivery. And, and I know that there's a, a real issue in terms of the compensation that these people are receiving and, and how, we, how we augment or improve that. So that, that's kind of where I'm driving at here. Ms. Bartolik. So Mr. Chair, um, there is an agency involved. So an agency, um, for, I'm going to take first for regular PCA, reg, the regular personal care, there is a P, an agency. Um, the agency is responsible as the employer to make sure all the training is done. Time cards, the agency is the one who works through the schedule, assigns people to work, gets the time cards from the person. Uh, the recipient is supposed to also be signing the time card to verify that they um, agree that the service was delivered. And then the agency bills DHS and pays the individual. Mm -hmm. We do have a program called a PCA Choice, which allows uh, people to hire and fire people themselves. They still have to go through an agency, a financial management agency. So all the payment from DHS Medicaid goes to that entity, and they're the ones who then pay the workers. Um, but they are not considered the employer. The person has much more of the responsibility of the hiring and firing and supervision. 
Okay. Senator Rothman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, the, the reason I want to get in detail on this is, uh, uh, I believe, um, Ms. Ham, you testified that there were 1.4 million in overpayments. My question is, was any of that ever recovered? Ms. Ham. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Ralph. Yes, I can't give you the exact number right now. Uh, we'd have to look at it, but typically uh, we do have the ability, especially if the provider continues in the program, we do have the ability to take that out of future payments. Uh, so that is typically how we will get most of the, the money back, but we'd have to do some, I could tell you how, many, how much money we took in last year, but it wouldn't necessarily be related specifically to these 2016 overpayments. Mm -hmm. But we can certainly get you those numbers. Okay, uh, 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 Mr. Chair, sure. the, the, the question I guess, and I'm sorry, it just flew by me. Um, so you have people that have actually committed fraud and you say that they are allowed to continue in the, in the business? because uh, you say you're recovering it from the providers uh, from future billings. And so in other words, we are, what are we doing with these people? What kind, I mean, are we allowing people to con who, who committed fraud, directly stood up and said, I want this money, they took it illegally, and they're still, and they're still working for us? Ms. Ham. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Ralph. No, that is not the circumstance. <laughs> so um, if we think about, uh, as Alex explained the situation, you have the individual workers and you have the agencies. Mm -hmm. And so if, for example, the um, particular individual had committed fraud and we were able to show that um, and they have a right to a hearing and whatnot, we could terminate them from the program so they could not work in it, but then the agency, if they were not at fault, they, didn't, they had taken all the proper per precautions to try to make sure this didn't happen and whatnot, we wouldn't suspend them, terminate them, but we would make them pay the money back. So it, and there are other circumstances where we haven't shown there's fraud. Maybe it's a mistake, it's an error, it's a double billing, whatnot. In those cases, we will take the money back, but we wouldn't terminate them uh, you know, based on that conduct. So it's all, but yes, if, if we can show that you personally are, you know, the individual has committed fraud, they will not be continuing in the program. Thanks, and we have to kind of keep moving a little bit, but I have just a couple of questions, and maybe you can answer them today, or uh, they're coming back tomorrow to Senator Ralph, so, and maybe uh, if these are too long of answers, but you mentioned 189 completed cases. Uh, your colleagues at the Department of Health uh, probably had about that many completed cases, but they only hit a fraction of how many were complaints. I presume you're complaint-driven or somebody reports, and so how many reports did you get in a year that are open or you, whatever. Do you have some data about that? And if it's, if it's complicated, I'll take it tomorrow. Yeah, uh, you know what, why don't I, I'll have you that ready for you tomorrow. It, it is, we do have a, a 2016 OIG report which has a lot of these numbers, but uh, right now we are primarily uh, complaint driven, but it is my uh, intention that we will be moving to a much more uh, data driven, um, uh, response so that we will be trying to, we will be triaging complaints and whatnot so that we can really focus in on the major fraud and because uh, we can't do everything. We simply can't even with the additional positions that we're, we're getting which uh, we can't do everything. So it is my intention that we will really be trying to be more data driven and looking at in our, uh, what is going to be the most likely, uh, this is a big investigation, this involves multiple people, we need to spend more resources on this, whereas this is an individual that may have, um, you know, had one incidence of, um, you know, bit inappropriate billing. Thank you, and Ms. Ham, I, um, do you have an idea what percent of the PCA program is fraudulent? There's been wild <laughs> numbers thrown about in the past, it's, uh, more than I, a percent, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I have no idea, especially given um, how short a time I've been with DHS. The typical estimates just on healthcare fraud in general in throughout the industry, throughout CMS, is typically five to 10%. I have no basis to know whether it's higher or lower. All right, and so um, I remember the 10 people we added, I remember the savings that came about from that was mostly because of the FFP and the projections of what you're gonna save was less than the salary of each worker. And so uh, for this member who is here, uh, 
if we're just going to make back the salaries of who's investigating, we haven't really found the systemic things we have to find. And so um, I remember also we were concerned about giving numbers to all the providers because that was a nightmare to the, to the, the this, the state can do computer changes with no cost and it's always wonderful. Uh, but for these private providers, it would have been a burden. So that was the issue. So if we can find a way without sinking the providers that above the 30% line who are doing good and they don't have any fraud in their systems and they're on top of their game. So I'm all over that. And I do want to, as best we can, totally mess with the life of the individuals who are running agencies that are not complying, who are stealing money from people who should get it. So. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I guess I, I just want to be clear that although there aren't requirements, the vast majority of agencies are absolutely doing everything they can to make sure that they are not submitting, that, you know, that their workers are doing the right thing. They have internal uh, systems built in so that they can be monitoring that. That is not where I'm talking about. I'm always talking about the tiny percentage that are taking advantage of our system. So I don't mean to paint at all that you know all PCA agencies or HCBS agencies are not doing something right. They are. They're doing everything correct. It's just that when we want to hold accountable those few who aren't, if we don't have any teeth, we can't do it. Gotcha. I think that's a good place to have you uh, say thank you for your testimony. Um, Ms. Turner, you can come down, and Ms. Patman, you're on deck. Thank you. Um, thanks. Yeah, so we'll uh, take up some more things tomorrow, and I appreciate all your work. So now we're going to hear from the provider side. And uh, Ms. Turner, uh, how many providers are there that you're representing today? <laughs> Thank you, Many Mr. hundreds, Chair. I'm sure. I, I, uh, ARM represents about 150, approximately 150 providers of home and community-based services, <laughs> primarily under the waiver and in our ICF services. Okay. So I want to take the opportunity, first of all, to as an educational piece, we, when we come here... Oh, I forgot to, to have you. I screwed up your presentation. So <laughs> tell us who you are. That's and okay. You can, I'm, I'm Art Turner right, with ARM, and ARM is a trade association that represents about 150 providers. I want to take the opportunity as today to, first of all, make sure that people understand that there are PCA services and there are HCBS wavered services, which are not the same services, and oftentimes we kind of all get everything lumped together and start thinking that everything that applies to one also applies to the other. So I represent pro uh, providers who do not primarily PCA, but do the other, the, the ICF and the wayward services. And in those services, one of the major differences is that those services have requirements for training and habilitation components. There's, there's outcomes. There's, there's different things that get done within that service package. Some of the things may look similar to some of the cares that are done by PCAs, but it is a different service with different expectations, different licensing requirements, and a different amount of oversight to the service itself. The other thing I want to just speak to is the documentation thing, and I think um, I think there was a little clarification at the end, but certainly every provider who does services has requirements for documentation. They have to write what happened, what got accomplished, what didn't accomplish. There's time cards. Or there are various things that we can bring out to say, yes, services got provided. I think what they were speaking to is we don't currently have a requirement for a system where that integrates directly into a, a, the, all the billing questions that might be raised. Exactly what time did they start? We don't submit that as part of our billing, but certainly if someone came out to an office or came to a provider and said, can you show me that Joe was actually doing such and such, or we have time cards, we have log notes, we have all those things. So I want to clarify that there definitely is tons of documentation. In fact, that's one of the provider's problems sometimes is trying to figure out a balance between providing service and documenting that you provided the service. I think if you talk to some of the DSPs that do the work, they say, if they could only do service and not do documentation, everyone's lives would actually be a lot better. So trying to figure out what that balance is is going to be really important. And Ms. Turner, are there audits sometime? Does, a, does an agency person or a county person come out and say, okay, we're going to scrutinize Bill Smith's 
treatment records and service records for the past year. Sure, there's and, all. And, and so, do they actually go and is that a periodic or is it random or does that how often does that happen? So there's a, there's a couple things. So there are licensing audits um, at least normally every other year routinely um, where people are coming and randomly selecting individuals where they're going to look at their records, make sure all the requirements for statutory regulations are in place. And then there are also um, random um, OIG audits and random federal SERS audits. So there's the possibility of having your books audited and as a, when I was a provider, I was I participated in that and it can be you know fairly daunting and intimidating yeah. process. So you you want to make sure you have your, your ducks in a row because you never know when someone might come in. Again, does it happen every day? No, but could it happen any day? Yes, to any provider. So uh, I also want to you know just make the broad statement people that I represent, the members that I represent, we say fraud is bad. We, we do not want fraud. We want to make sure that, that things are in place so that fraud doesn't happen. In fact, we worked with on legislation just this last year that was passed, working with the department on some data collection processes that will help us collect information so we will have more information about what's being spent where and all of those things. Having said that, I also want to um, kind of reiterate some other comments. Um, and I, I think the word was tiny percentage. There are bad players. In anything where humans are involved, it's sad to say, there are usually a lot of really good people and then always those people looking to see how they can take advantage of a system. And I think no matter what we put into place, there's always the possibility that someone's gonna find the workaround. And so while we want to make sure we're dealing with the bad players, whatever we put in place and whatever changes we might make to a system, we need to make sure that it doesn't impact so negatively the good players that they stop being players at all. That, that, that we, we have things that become so burdensome because we're trying to take care of those two people over here that the hundred people over here start falling apart because they're just chasing, trying to, 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 to do things they, and, and prove they're doing things that they would have done all along, okay? Um, I think and I also think we have to perhaps find ways to reward the good players so that, and, and perhaps make it tougher for the bad players to get in in the first place. And I think there are some, some ways in our system um, with some of our services that if there were a higher bar to begin with to get into doing whatever they need, whatever they're proposing to do, and I know it's a balance because we need diversity and we need you know lots of providers and we need lots of things, but looking to see how we can make sure that um, people are the right people who, who, who are doing the services. Um, I think one of the concerns that I have with the, the rec one of the recommendations in the auditor's report was that we implement some of the things that were similar to what, what were, was implemented for PCA pro the PCA program. And I think because the services are so different, some of that would be next to nearly impossible if you're talking about actually registering every DSP and having DSPs bill. And I, I, th those things, I can't imagine how our system could sus sustain it. And I also we feel that that hasn't really solved the problem in the PCA system. The bad apples are still the bad apples and there's still problems. And so kind of doing some robust changes to how we implement things, I think we really need to make sure we um, determine that it's actually going to make a difference and, and really have some impact for all the work that it will take. Um, I want to reinforce, and I know everyone knows it, but we are in the middle of a horrendous work, work workforce crisis, and so any changes that we make to how we operate and what we expect and what we need, we have to do that with the understanding that it, it can impact that and make our situation even worse. We are struggling to make sure that we are providing services to the people who need it and to make more hoops and more barriers to the people who are trying to do that, this um, is just something that isn't, pop, you know, can't, can't happen. I love the fact that technology was brought up and it is ARM's, one of ARM's main um, kind of passions right now is trying to encourage people to look at how technology can be used to supplement or um, uh, in some places even um, substitute for hands-on staff time. We need to use people, 
where we, there are certain things technology can't do. We haven't learned how to um, give showers with robots or any of those kind of things. So we need humans to do those human activities. But there are lots of things, including prompting and reminders and, and even s supervision that can be done without a person being in, in, in the spot or in, in a person's face. And I want to put a little pitch out. ARM has invested dollars and commitment to, to making resources available so that people and teams and case managers and families can go to a website and start learning more about this and learning how it can work and seeing some of the successes. So if you go to arm.org slash technology, you'll go to a web page that's free to everybody. It's open. We're putting resources up there, uh, trying to explain to people, uh, sharing success stories, but helping people work through the, this process. So, um, And we actually worked to pass legislation last year that requires some discussion at planning meetings so that everyone across the state of Minnesota has the opportunity for the use of technology, so it's not just you know, kind of randomly by whether a county likes or doesn't like the idea, but everyone can start having those discussions. So I, we think that's one of the, the limited ways that we can start really making a difference is looking at how we approach doing services differently and technology is one of those things. We all use it, why should it be any different for people with a disability? Um, there is. Uh, there was also mention about the Cures Act and the electronic visit verification, and we, of course, are very um, concerned about who that's going to impact and, and how, what that's going to look like. Uh, I think the state of Minnesota, the Department of Human Services, is still waiting for some confirmation from CMS on exactly what services are, is this going to be required for? I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago talking to CMS folks directly, and the conversations we had made it seem pretty broad. So it wasn't just PCAs, it wasn't just home care, it could in fact impact most of the waivered services we provide, and that would be very, very significant. So that was, again, I talked to CMS people who were saying this, but Minnesota hasn't gotten any official word, so we'll, we'll kind of see. As we're watching this and moving forward, we want to make sure that we, we do whatever we need to meet those requirements, yet don't do something. Sometimes Minnesota tries really hard to be the best at everything. So if this is okay, let's do this. And sometimes this is okay, and we have to be okay with saying, what's the minimum? Okay, good, check, we've done it, and let's move on. With electronic visit verification, we have a number of members, a number of our providers who already have systems in place because it's good business practice. They have ways of verifying that someone was at the site when they were supposed to be and left when they were supposed to leave and all of those things. So we wanna make sure whatever um, is, is implemented to meet the Cures Act requirements for the state of Minnesota takes into consideration that we already have systems in place and we don't, we would be very opposed to making people who have systems totally have to revamp, totally have to redo. There's cost to that and these are folks who have already invested in something that's going kind of above and beyond and we wouldn't want to make them redo everything. Um, again, unless there was reimbursement. We're willing to do anything as a provider that's requested by the state as long as there's corresponding funds to help us do whatever it is that's being requested. Uh, so I think that covers my main points. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I'm willing to take them. Uh, well, I appreciate um, you kind of capping off uh, you know, all three, now you're the fourth presenter on an important topic. And, and what I hear is what you said loud and clear is the association, the organizations, and most of the providers are all over, um, make sure that the services are quality, uh, honest, delivered in a good way. And there's a handful of an undetermined amount of, of uh, maybe agencies, but certainly individuals who are taking advantage of our good nature and that none of us are in the mood to stand for that. But I just want to remind what I said when we were setting up the, the joint presentation with uh, DHS is that you want to make sure you're focusing your effort on the, on the right group, and Ms. Turner made that point very eloquently in the beginning of her program. And so um, the concerns I have about doing more things have been based upon that. Um, but I, we're going to take this up again, I think, in November, and maybe by then I'll see if a couple senators want to work on this. And, and uh, come up with some collaborative effort that at least by the time we get to session, that there can be a consensus on some points that make a lot of sense. And it seems like when there's a consensus between 
not just the associations, but that's you're a good example of a good association made up of providers who are trying really hard, um, and the department and the public and, and all that, that it's probably pretty good. So that's my interest in this and what I foresee coming. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, Ms. Petman, welcome to the committee. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm yeah. going to speak in a general sense. Um, if you want more details, um, I'll have to provide some of that information offline due to privacy concerns. And Ms. Petman, I'm okay. really glad you're here, and you, you have like up to 10 minutes. Okay, so, thank you. So I, we're glad you're here, and so okay. just, uh, Okay. It's great to have you here testifying. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, I'm going to speak on my experience, and I'll give you a little bit of my background. I um, am on the CADI waiver. I did work, um, worked for many years. My professional background is as a librarian, Master's of Library Science, Bachelor's of Communication. To just get it out of the way, yes, I do look different. That is because I have a fat disorder that is hormonally based. It was actually discovered at, in Mayo in 1940, and 17 and a half million women have this condition. So it's called lipoedema. I have lymphedema, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, hypermobility type three, basically means kind of like Gumby and Pokey, too flexible and joints pop out, not fun, lots of pain. And then I also have PTSD to, due to an unfortunate thing that happened to me when I was a small child. So that is um, my disabilities primarily. So I am glad that I am able to receive PCA services and homemaking services through the CADI waiver. Um, there aren't a lot of places that morbidly obese people can go in our state. If my mobility has been decreasing rapidly and I frankly don't know what to do, I cannot use a wheelchair for multiple reasons. The bariatric capability in our state for assisted living, um, for my payment type, and also nursing homes, it's just not there. So I do appreciate that I can receive these services. The worker shortage is terrible. Um, back in 2015, I came down here to help others and also speak about something that was happening to me. I met with senators and reps, the governor's office, deed, and others in both February and March of 2015, and very importantly, also with the deputy inspector general. So I can't give that information in public, of course. So I can speak about my own experience. Company one, well, I should just say, first of all, oftentimes the focus is on the client um, there are times where the company needs to be watched too, and so both of these examples are about companies. I would also like to emphasize that I used to live in the metro, now I live in greater Minnesota. I first lived in Stearns County, now I live in, Bent, in Benton. Um, when there is less um, choices, um, less eyes watching, and there's a worker shortage. Some agencies are full, they don't have workers. So um, a client can feel desperate because only one or two companies might have openings or based on where you live, there might only be one company. So company one was a small company, company two had multiple locations including Greater Minnesota and the Metro. So company one, um, a good example to just uh, think of as I go through this is when you go to a store and you use your card, like let's say you buy groceries, you expect to get a receipt. So when you're receiving services, getting a copy of the timesheet is like getting a receipt. So company one, they stopped giving out uh, the copy of the receipt or a triplicate. And I remembered when I lived in Rogers, there was a very good company, and um, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to name them, but if, you, if it's okay, I will name them later. Um, they said, you can have a copy, and that helped me keep track of my hours. And I remember that, and I thought, why can't I have a copy? I kept asking, can't I have a copy? I'm, the county tells me it's my job. And 
at first, after trying so hard, going into advocate mode, they said, okay, you can have them about a month later. And I thought, that's kind of weird. Um, and then they stopped, they stopped coming. So there were other things that were concerning me about this company and I just, I just thought that was very unfair to basically not get that for me to keep track of my records. Company two was much worse. The county said again, you are in charge of keeping track of your hours. So I estimated that I had at least 225 hours. You get a chunk of time and you get this many hours per week and then that's how much you get for the year. I kept calling and calling and calling and calling and I finally got to the main office. They kept evading me. They were not returning my calls. They weren't giving me good answers. And all of a sudden my hours were gone. I did not spend those hours. They just disappeared. In talking with the Deputy Inspector General and others back in 2015, they had a very long term for this, but they knew exactly what I was talking about. I said, I did not use those hours, and they just disappeared. And I didn't know what to do. So when we're looking at all different types of monitoring, please consider looking at everybody equally. It's good to monitor pe people, but please look at everybody. And so some solutions that might help based on, um, there's another really good company that I use for PCA Choice. Um, when they come out and open their packet, the Qualified Medical Professional provides supervision. In their packet, it's full of, uh, this is what to do if you suspect fraud or abuse. Call this number, it's not okay. They almost overdo it, but it's great that they do. I like that, and I've never seen any, but any other company do that. Could we use that as a model? When packets are opened, there are a couple statements that must be made. Um, could we add a bill that says, you have to say fraud is not okay, abuse is not okay, and here's a number to call and put it in the packet. I don't think there would be a big cost to that. Another good solution is the same company voluntarily sends out on a monthly basis, this is how many hours you have used and this is how many hours you have left. That helps the client, it helps the families, and it helps everyone. And um, if you could look at this bill, um, 2015 version of Senate File 1920, um, it was after the first policy deadline, so I don't think it got in, you know, in enough time and the person did try, it is some way to give people what I call receipts or copies of timesheets. And also something that could really help is if person-centered planning or person-centered thinking could be given to all involved in the PCA system. Um, it's my experience as a person receiving care, the training of the PCAs isn't enough um, if, if, the, if everyone involved could have a little bit of person-centered training, it would go a long way and save money. So those are some of my suggestions. Ms. Petman, thank you. Um, actually, Mr. Tabartola, can I just have you come up again? Um, you can tell me you'd rather respond later, but there's, I think some of those are pretty straightforward comments. And um, can you... And I'll give you the chance to defer because you're just under the gun here. But this uh, thing about receipts upon request, is that a, that seems like a pretty common sense, normal request that a consumer directed person might get to request. And is that surprising to you that that's not easy to get? Or do you, is that, anyway, just you want to react to that part, please? So, Mr. Chair, this is something I would like to get back to to understand a little bit more okay. of what the different practices are. I know a number of agencies do it. I would like to verify what the requirements are. I appreciate that, and um, and as a, uh, I'll just, I'm trying to be nice to you here. And so the other, as a person who, if there's a person-centered person in the state, that would be you. Uh, and so I'm sure you would love to have more person-centered training for the PCAs. And it, if it's simply a workforce issue, there, I mean the, if you had 3,800 and now you have 800 and 400, certainly the 
the interest level and the capacities of the people who are coming in aren't, you know, can't be quite so selective, but um, is there some of that baked in already where in the training that they have to consider the person-centeredness of what they're doing? Mr. Chair, it's a good question. There is training that should help them be able to work with individuals. We have made available uh, training that's an online training that has been developed uh, that's being used across the country on how to understand some of the basic principles about that, how to um, apply that. So there is online training that is available for workers. And uh, there also is additional training. The collective bargaining agreement with SEIU and the state does have a training committee. And this is one of the topics of how to really help workers understand um, individ, uh, independent living skills and person-centered approaches so that they are more competent in that. So there are additional trainings through that. I appreciate that. And, and per Ms. Turner's comments, I would imagine that requiring some of that would sink some of these operations. And, but you still you want a quality product. And yeah. So we've actually restated the workforce question again. So <laughs> um, thank you very much for coming up. And uh, any questions from members? I want to thank uh, Ms. Petman for coming, and I hope you uh, recognize that you kind of got our attention on those, those points. I appreciate your focus and the testimony. Um, we're going to come back in the afternoon at a uh, time certain, 1 o'clock, and talk about men choices. And uh, so I hope this has been productive, and I, I think it's actually worked out pretty well for content and time, and I, I found it very useful for me as a one member. And so there's... Um, we're not going to redo this topic in this format. Again, this is the treatment of it today. And so if you uh, are working with a member who, didn't, uh, who wasn't here today for whatever reason and want to have them be part of this process, uh, you might want to bring them up to speed on what we did and how you want to work with them. Um, so with that, uh, we're in recess. See you at 1 o'clock.